We have a wonderful Savior, and our faith is in the Lord who gave himself, and I hope you can say, for me. All right, let's take our Bibles and turn over to the book of Acts. And tonight we are looking at part two of Almost Believing is Not Enough. Almost Believing is Not Enough. We're looking at Acts chapter 26, verses 24 through 32. We've been looking and seeing that Paul was actually a, a witness in a court of law and rather important for him to be involved in a legal case because it helps us know what we ought to do if we ever got stuck in that kind of a situation. As I've said before, I think that probably we will. I think that probably you and I someday, if we, Lord tarries and if he loves to live long enough, will probably be hailed into court just for being Christians. That was the situation in which Paul found himself. We're starting reading in verse 24. And as he thus spake for himself, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, thou art beside thyself. Much learning doth make thee mad. But he said, I am not mad, most noble Festus, but speak forth the words of truth and of soberness. <clears throat> for the king knoweth of these things, before whom I also speak freely. For I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him. For this thing was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? I know that thou believest. <clears throat> then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost, thou persuadest me to be a Christian? And Paul said, I would to God that not only thou, but also all that hear me this day were both almost and all together such as I am, except these bonds. And when he had thus spoken, I want you to note carefully the response. When he had thus spoken, the king rose up and the governor and Bernice and they that sat with them. And when they were gone aside, they talked between themselves, saying, This man doeth nothing worthy of death or of bonds. Then Agrippa said unto Festus, Here is Agrippa's response. This man might have been set at liberty. He should have been. If he had not appealed to Caesar, trying to sit on the technicality of the law to avoid doing what is right. How often we do that. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we pray for your blessing on your word as it goes forth tonight, that it will not return void, but that it will accomplish that which you please and that it will prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. We're your people. We sit here tonight humbly at your feet. We want to be taught by your spirit. And then we want to be empowered, motivated, and catapulted forth to obey. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now I asked John this evening when you all came in to please give each of you a piece of paper because the things that I'm going to talk about tonight are some of the most important things that you will ever hear me preach. I hope you are taking notes tonight. And I hope afterwards you go over your notes and that you read them. If you don't have a piece of paper, feel free to come up here and get one of those note-taking sheets. I'm going to just spend a minute going over what we covered last week because it's the foundation for what we're talking about tonight, Almost Believing is Not Enough, Part 2. Last week we talked about presenting the gospel always produces a response one way or the other. It can produce embarrassment if it's made in public. It can produce mockery. We saw both those were present here. It can produce anger even to the point of murder, and we saw an illustration of that over in Acts chapter 14. 
It can produce envy. Sometimes people who are jealous of your success in preaching the gospel will do what they can to destroy you out of envy. And we saw an illustration of that over in Acts 17. Paul, Paul experienced all of these different responses when he preached the gospel. His message didn't change, but the hearts of the people were different each place he went. We saw sometimes preaching the gospel produces persecution. Since the gospel changes lives, people who lose money will persecute, like closing down a bar when the former drunks get saved. And we talked about that in Acts chapter 16 with the damsel possessed with a spirit of divination who brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. And Paul casts out the demon, and so they have them arrested. Sometimes proclamation of the gospel results in people wanting to delay, to put off an appropriate response to the gospel. And that, of course, is what we have here tonight. Sometimes people put it off for ulterior motives. And Felix was an illustration of that. He wanted to get a bribe. So he kept Paul for a long time, and he heard Paul many times. How stupid was that? How much more accountable is Felix? Festus heard him perhaps twice. Felix, it says, heard him multiple times. Agrippa heard him once. They're all accountable, but a person who's heard the gospel over and over and over again and then for some ulterior motive does not obey it you know God wants you not only to believe it but to obey it we're going to talk about that tonight sometimes there are a lot of different responses and we saw those many responses outlined for us in Acts 17 where Paul went to the Areopagus and different kinds of people responded in different way but there was a small group there in Acts chapter 17 that believed Verse 34, Howbeit certain men clave unto him and believed, among which was Dionysius the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. And that's the response we always hope for when we proclaim the gospel, which is the response of salvation. We saw the vision appearing to the Apostle Paul over in Acts chapter 17. And there stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. And just five verses later, we find Lydia and all of her household being saved. A man had appeared in the vision, but it was a woman who first came to Christ. And what a clear direction God gave. You know, we most of the time don't have any idea what God is doing in our lives, don't have any sense of his direction. And so we just sort of go on our own carnal ways and float through life, never realizing God has given us clear direction. Or when the clear direction came, we said, well, that's impossible, so I'm not going to do that. We don't even think about the possibility because, after all, it doesn't fit our preconceived notion. Where had Paul been trying to go with his evangelistic organization? He had been trying to go east. And God told him, go west, young man, go west. Can you imagine if the gospel had spread east? And so the gospel then went to Iran and Iraq, Saudi Arabia, to the ancient Persian Empire, to India, to China, to the Philippines, to Indonesia, to Japan. What if God had said to Paul, yeah, I know that's the way you want to go, so I'm going to go ahead and, and put my stamp of approval on it. Would we be here today? Folks, we need to learn not to move ahead on anything, especially major decisions in life, until we have clear direction from God, because God wants you in the center of his will more than you want to be in the center of his will. You've heard me say that before. I'm going to say it again right now. God wants you to be in the center of his will more than you want to to be in the center of his will. So if you don't know the will of God, don't blame God. 
What it means is you've closed the eyes of your heart to his will. You've closed your eyes to the commands of his word as to his will. Don't blame other people. God never leaves you without a light. Children of Israel wandering in the wilderness. Yes, it's the wilderness, but God was with them and he never left them without direction. They didn't wander aimlessly through the wilderness. They followed the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. God wants you to know his will. He's not hiding it from you. Our flesh gets in the way. Other people get in the way. The world gets in the way. The devil's always trying to throw tax down in the way so that we think, man, I don't want to go that way. I'd have to step on some tax. The will of God. Clear direction the Apostle Paul has received. And as a result, because God had chosen a certain woman by the name of Lydia, a seller of purple in the city of Thyatira, Oh, Thyatira, have you read the epistle to the church at Thyatira in the book of Revelation? Here our first converts are a woman at a women's Bible study down by the riverside. I'm not going to do it tonight, but I, I encourage you, look up Thyatira in the book of Revelation, the letter to the church at Thyatira. See what the specific problems were at that church. Satan wanted to attack a specific segment of the church because he hated what happened this day. But I digress. And then we close with 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. Now is the day of salvation. Almost is not enough. We then, as workers together with him, beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee, that is, I've come to your rescue. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. And that brings us to the message for tonight, Almost Believing is Not Enough, Part 2. Now, <clears throat> I would like you to write something down. I want you to write down the key to the message tonight. It's short, but here's the key to the message tonight. Genuine faith, genuine faith will change your life. Genuine faith will change your life and the way you live. Genuine faith will change your life and the way you live. As I said at the beginning of the message, I hope you pay attention tonight. It'll be one of the most important messages I preach on really believing versus being a phony, which is perfectly illustrated for us in our text tonight by King Agrippa. When we talk about believing, that is the verbal form of the word faith in the New Testament. Pistos is the Greek word translated faith. Pistuo is the verbal form meaning to believe. We're dealing with the issue of believing tonight. Will somebody do it or not? In other words, will they have faith? Now, some time ago, I preached a series on the spiritual gifts in the evening service, and you all were here then. So I hope that you recall that one of the spiritual gifts was the gift of faith. We saw that the gift of faith gives every believer the capacity to grow spiritually when they choose to walk by faith. Do you hear any echoes of this morning's sermon? In terms of progressive sanctification, walking in the light, walking in the spirit, walking by faith, that deals with faith in the context of the spiritual gifts, exercising faith that you have. It enables you to grow spiritually when you choose to walk by faith. That spiritual gift is stated both in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, and also in Romans chapter 12, verse 3. Now tonight, I want to start off by giving you a definition of faith, and I'll tell you a secret. This is a very old definition. It's
it's almost as old as I am. Well, actually, it's a little older. No, it's not as old as I am. I'm kidding. I wrote this definition more than 40 years ago after studying every passage I could find in the Bible on faith. Since then, of course, I've learned a lot. I've grown a lot. I've seen many more passages that give new insights into faith, more illustrations of faith, and more applications of faith. But the original definition that I wrote still sticks. So if you have your pencils, I hope I don't have to tell you this all the way through, but I'm going to give you a definition. So take your pen or pencil and the note sheet and write it down. You will find that this fits every time you hear something preached on faith in the scripture. Here it is, the definition. Faith is complete confidence in the word of God. It can be the verbal word, it can be the written word, but faith is complete confidence in the word of God. Now tonight we're going to be talking about saving faith because we're looking at Agrippa. We're looking at all these people who were sitting there in the council, all the people that were standing around listening, all the Jews who were there to prosecute Paul. So I'm going to talk about the next part of that definition, saving faith, saving faith, if you're writing definitions, here's the rest of the definition, saving faith is created in the elect, saving faith is created in the elect by what the sovereign God reveals himself to be. Saving faith is created in the elect by what the sovereign God reveals himself to be. Now we see in 1 Corinthians 12, 9, where faith is listed as one of the spiritual gifts, it's given by the Spirit, according to verse 8, which means as this goes together in that list of spiritual gifts, that it's not something you work up inside yourself, it is a gift from God. He says, to one is given the spiritual word of wisdom, and then you get down to the next verse, to another, faith by the same spirit. It's listed as a gift from the spirit of God, just like the gift of healing, which is mentioned next, or just by the, like the gift of miracles, which is the next one mentioned, or prophecy. It's one of the gifts. A gift is not something you earn. A gift is not something you have naturally. It's something that is given to you. It's also clear that, gift, that faith is a gift to God, to every believer. Otherwise, no one would ever believe and be saved. And we see that over in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that... What is your nearest antecedent? What is the nearest noun to what he's referring to? It's faith. That, that is the faith, is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You all know those verses. Remember what it's talking about, that faith is a gift from God. Here it's in the context of salvation. The first was the context of spiritual gifts, which are the manifestation of the Spirit in the life of the believer. We're going to see that those two things tie together very closely tonight. Because you have saving faith, you also have, it's one of those every believer gifts, you also have faith as part of the spiritual gifts. Which means that saving faith is going to have a manifestation with all to profit every man. That means it's going to show up in the way you live. We see a certain response from Agrippa in our text tonight, and we saw it in Felix and in Festus and in Bernice and in the council. They had an intellectual knowledge, but they never had fruit. Oh, fruit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness. What's the next one? Faith, you're right. Meekness, temperance. 
So we see faith as a spiritual gift. We see saving faith. We see faith as the fruit of the Spirit. There are two more we're going to talk about a little bit later. Five different ways that the word faith is used in the New Testament, and every one of them are tied together, and you do not have one without the other. You see, faith is rather important as far as God is concerned. And so he gives you five different things that are so knit together they can never be pulled apart so that that which is invisible inside of you that only God sees will become visible in the sight of men. When in terms of applying it, we find that faith is proportional. You all know of the faith of George Mueller. You all know of the faith of Hudson Taylor. You all know of the faith of the Apostle Paul. But God puts us in different situations of life. And some require a larger portion of faith than others. How big is your faith? But you know, faith can grow. The more you obey, the more your faith grows. Listen to what Paul says. For I say through the grace given unto me, this is Romans chapter 12, verse 3, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man, and in the context it's believers, the measure of faith. The measure of a word that deals with proportionality, with size of faith. Jesus said to the disciples, O ye of little faith. The disciples responded, Lord, increase our faith. Faith can grow. But there are some striking differences as well as similarities with the faith of the spiritual gifts and the saving faith that Paul is talking about to Agrippa in our text today. Faith is said in contrast to works by Paul in Ephesians, but in James, faith is set in complement, not in contrast to works. Ephesians, faith contrasted with works. In James, faith as a complement to works. By the way, that's spelled with an E and not with an I. Complete. Think of complete. Complement, not complement. Works that are empowered by God and that God approves complete genuine faith. We're not talking about God saying nice things about faith according to James. We're talking about the completion of faith is the way that it shows up in your works. You recall that when we studied the gift of faith, we mentioned that the term faith is used in at least five ways in the Bible. I've just given you three of them, especially in the New Testament. So now write these down, five things. They're easy, they're short. Five things that are keys to faith. Number one, saving faith. Number two, what we've been talking about in the morning worship service sanctifying faith. So number one is saving faith. Number two is sanctifying faith. Number three is the spiritual gift of faith. Number four, faith as the fruit of the Spirit. And then we have faith used in a very special way with the definite article, the word the or the, in the New Testament. The Apostle Paul talks about the faith, the faith, once and for all delivered unto the saints. It's referring to that body of revealed truth that was handed down to us. In other words, the scripture. The faith, once and for all delivered to the saints. That body of truth handed down to us in Scripture centered around the gospel, which is what Paul is preaching to Agrippa, and which we are to defend and for which we are to die if it is necessary. The faith, 
definite article, a specific content and body of truth. Now, we have a description, not a definition. I gave you a definition, but we have a description of faith in Hebrews 11. This is a description, but not a definition. You'll see why in just a moment. I gave you a definition, but here's the description. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now, that little opening statement is followed by what in Hebrews 11? The heroes of faith. Okay, so he gives us a description of what it's going to be like. Not a definition, but he gives us a description. And then he says, let me illustrate for you what I'm talking about. And he gives us this whole chapter on heroes of faith. They didn't all do the same thing, but they all had one characteristic in common. They all received the word of God. They believed the word of God and they acted upon the word of God, some of them to death. That's the last half of the chapter. First half is all the glorious victories, last half of the chapter, but others, but others. And it tells you about them. Thrown to wild beasts, torn asunder, slain with a sword, persecuted, hounded around out in the wilderness and caves and rocks and dens of the earth. And all of them had faith. And then it closes by saying, these without us should not be made perfect or teleos, complete. The list is not complete in Hebrews 11. Those are not the only people, even in the Bible, that showed faith. And Paul says, there are still blank lines on the list. Is your name there? The five aspects of faith are given to us so that we have a complete rounded picture and a whole list of heroes of faith is given to us so we can see that faith applies in many different life situations and so that we can learn to do what we were talking about this morning which is walking by faith that's progressive practical sanctification God is bringing us through a wilderness called earth called the world so that we will stand without shame in that list of heroes of faith. Ah, dear ones, do you understand why I said this is one of the most important messages I can preach to you? How I wish everyone was here. Here's something I don't want you to forget. That lesson in Hebrews 11, Genuine faith, you can write this down, genuine faith always, not sometimes, always results in action. Not in action, but in action. Genuine faith always results in action. Genuine faith always results in works of righteousness. Not in carnal works, not in hesitation, not in rebellion. Remember what we're talking about in the Old Testament this morning. I took you to the end of those wilderness wanderings where we found out what happened to the children of Israel. Instead of walking by faith, they rebelled. Ten times. God said, you're going to die in the wilderness. He sent them back. Oh, they said, no, we're going to go forward. They tried to go forward. But he sent them back. Dear people, genuine faith always results in works of righteousness. Remember what James said? Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Okay, show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my 
works. The works don't save you, but they are the automatic, the guaranteed result of genuine faith. Those five things I talked about a moment ago in faith, it's going to show up in your life. If you really believe, it'll change the way you live. It will change your life. People, that's the heart of everything I preach. How has it affected you? You hang on to it for a minute and then you slide right back into, but I want to do it this way. But I really want this. Oh, how I, much I did. I really, really want this. And you don't listen. Are you sure you're saved? Paul warns the believers and he says, you know, you better examine yourself to see whether or not you be in the faith or whether or not you be reprobate. Are you walking in the flesh? Or are you walking in the spirit? Is your life characterized by constantly being controlled by the flesh or being controlled by the spirit of God? We're talking about practical, progressive sanctification, a day-by-day -day change. You should be walking closer to Christ today than you were yesterday. And tomorrow you should be walking closer to Christ than you were today. It's a walk, and it's described as growth. And it produces fruit. And it produces works of righteousness. That's what genuine faith is all about. Now, you know, that kind of faith is more than intellectual knowledge. A lot of people have intellectual knowledge. They know lots and lots and lots of stuff. I mean, you know, they got the Bible memorized. I, I know of Jews who have memorized the entire Old Testament. I had a, a good friend when I was in Israel. He knew a lot of Bible. I'd start, I was witnessing to him. His name was Arik. I'd witness to him. And as I'm going over these passages, which I could only quote in English, he would begin to quote them to me in Hebrew. He had memorized major portions of the Old Testament. In Hebrew, he was an Israeli Jew. He'd been studying to be a rabbi. He knew some of the passages better than I knew them. But his eyes were closed. Knowing the scriptures is not enough. Agrippa knew the scriptures. Agrippa knew the prophets. Agrippa knew what the prophets were talking about. Agrippa had an intellectual belief. But Agrippa is in hell today because it had never changed his life. The kind of faith we're talking about is much more than the intellectual knowledge that Paul says that Agrippa has in our text for tonight. And so we know for sure that Agrippa did not have saving faith. Why? Because of his works. He yielded to the pressure of the Jews. He yielded to the pressure of open court with a written record being recorded. People could go back and they could look at what was written down and they would know precisely what Agrippa said and how he responded. And he sure didn't want in some written record of the Romans to say, and Agrippa began to weep and fell on his face before the Apostle Paul and said, what must I do to be saved? Like the Philippian jailer had done in chapter 16. You see, genuine faith is not an intellectual faith. There are brilliant people who know the Bible, but their works prove they're not saved. What did James say? A man may say, thou hast faith and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works. You cannot prove faith without works. Because James says, I will show you. In other words, visible to somebody else. God sees your heart. But James talking about what do other people see in your life when you claim to believe? 
What do other people see in your life when you claim to believe? What do other people see in your life when you claim to believe? Doesn't know how, matter how much you know. I had an incredible professor when I was in Israel, a young Jew who spoke five or six different languages and who could read the Greek New Testament. And he used it as a primary source in our classes at the Hebrew University. He would be lecturing in Hebrew, and then the name of the course was the work of the priests in the temple at the end of the second temple period, according to Mishnaic sources. Try to swallow that one. What it means was, what were the, the priests doing in the temple at the time of Jesus? And the New Testament tells you a lot of the stuff that the priests were doing. And so he would open his Greek New Testament, and he would translate from Koine Greek into modern Hebrew for his class. He knew more than any professor I have ever met in the United States about Hebrew. Certainly, that was his mother tongue. And about Greek. But he was lost. Jacob Yaakov Herr. Doesn't matter what you know. How has it changed your life? Are you walking with Jesus today? Are you walking more closely with Jesus tomorrow? Will you be walking more closely with Jesus the next day? Because faith produces works and it produces fruit. And fruit is the result of growth. The result of more growth. The result of more growth. And Jesus said, you're not just going to bear fruit. You're going to bear more fruit. You're going to bear much fruit. What's part of the fruit of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Faith is the key to progressive sanctification because faith is the key to walking in the Spirit. Think about yourself a year ago. Are you walking more closely with Jesus today than you did then? I know people who think, well, you know, I've been a Christian now for 45 years, so I'm doing pretty well, and I'm, I'm coasting along and really just enjoying it. You know what? It means that you're not growing, because if you were growing, you would be getting more opposition. The wilderness wandering testings would be harder. The battles of going into the land across the river and fighting with the giants would be even more difficult today than they were then. I see that in my life. Exactly the same pattern that we've been looking at in the morning worship services. It gets harder! But the faith is stronger and the victories are sweeter. And the giants are bigger, but they fall harder. Are you sure you're alive? I mean spiritually. We're talking about God's kind of faith, not Agrippa's kind of faith. When Paul says, Agrippa, dost thou believe the prophets? I know that thou believest. He had the intellectual kind of faith. But he did not have saving faith. And we know that by his response, by his works. He yielded to the pressure of the Jews. He yielded to the political pressure of open court with a written record of being recorded. He yielded to the pressure of political correctness. He had a brilliant, articulate head knowledge of the prophets, but it wasn't enough. He was not saved. Faith and guaranteed works are what we see if we continue reading in the next verse in Ephesians chapter 2. I just read you those ones that you know. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, For by grace ye saved through faith, and not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But guaranteed works are found in verse 10, the very next verse. For we are his workmanship, in other words, God's making us, created in Christ Jesus. There's our positional sanctification. And now we get to progressive sanctification. Unto good works, which God hath 
before ordained that we should walk. Do you hear the word walk? Walk in them. Are there no good works in your life? Maybe it's because the first part of the verse doesn't apply to you. In Christ. Because if you're in Christ, Jesus, you have been created unto good works. And it wasn't just you had the door open so that you could do them. It says, which God hath. God did it. So it's not going to fall flat on its face, which God hath ordained before, ahead of time. Predestination. God has predestined good works in the life of the believer because he's bringing you through the wilderness. That we should walk in them. That's in the Bible, people. I'm not making that up. Read Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 in the context of verse 10. He's talking about what genuine faith is like. Agrippa didn't have it. There are two other key elements that interplay in those verses 8, 9, and 10 here in Ephesians 2. Number one is, write these down. Number one, faith always precedes works of genuine righteousness. Not sometimes, but always. Faith always precedes works of genuine righteousness. Number two, faith always produces works of genuine righteousness. Not sometimes, but always, because God has predestined it. Those are the two key words, precedes and produces. Precedes and produces. Genuine faith always precedes genuine works of righteousness. Faith always produces genuine works of righteousness. You see, that's why you can't do good works in order to obtain salvation. That's also why you cannot claim to be saved even though you never do good works from the divine perspective. Why? Because God has predestined good works to be performed by the elect to whom he has given saving faith. Remember, we talked about faith as the gift of God, and we saw that both in the context of salvation and in the context of the spiritual gifts. Now, let's talk about good works for a minute. Biblical good works are not defined by cultural standards. Let me say that again. You know, when I say things more than once, it's because I'm hoping you're writing them down. Biblical good works are not defined by cultural standards. Every culture in the world is marred by sin. Every culture in the world is marred by sin. Some try to set a standard for your holiness that is contrary to the Bible, usually based upon either the Old Testament law of Moses, like in the Orthodox Jews, where they think they're getting saved by keeping the law, or in other cultures where you're going to make it to nirvana or whatever their concept of heaven is by having a karma of good works which they define so that you can do okay in your next reincarnation. So most cultures have both salvation and sanctification either tied to the works of God under the law or the works of man under their made-up system. Even in Christianity, so-called, you have Roman Catholicism, or you have all kinds of different things. You've got penances, and you've got novenas, and you've got masses, and you've got prayers for the dead, and you've got the lighting of candles, which now what they do is they flip on a switch and an electric light bulb goes on. You've got confessions to the priest. You've got pilgrimages to Rome. You've got climbing the Scala Sancta on your knees. You've got an audience with the Pope. Oh, wow. You've got donations to the church, and big ones. Hmm. Boy, you're working off a lot of time in purgatory. 
salvation and becoming holy by doing miracles after death. And so you receive beatification or sainthood when the Pope says so. Dear people, what God says is genuine salvation comes to you because God predestined it. And because he predestined that, he predestined the good works that you should walk in them. Do you not see anything in your life? Do you see no growth? It maybe means that the tree isn't growing because the tree is dead. Faith without works is, what does James say? Faith without works is dead. Not half alive, not almost dead. It's dead. The works don't save you, but the works and faith are tied together with two little words that begin with P. Faith always, what's the first one? Precedes works of genuine righteousness, not sometimes, but always, according to James. Faith always, what's the second one? Produces works of genuine righteousness, not sometimes, but always. And that's why you can't do good works to obtain salvation. That's why you can't claim to be saved if you never do good works from the divine perspective. We're not talking about cultural standards here. Biblical good works are not defined by cultural standards. Biblical good works are not defined by reason. Western civilization likes to use reason. But the good works are not defined by reason. Biblical good works are not defined by humanitarian standards. There are all kinds of do-gooder organizations out there running around the world and trying to dig wells for people and bring food to people and, you know, do peacenik kind of pacifist marches and uh, vigils at night whereby they hold up signs that says, you know, goodbye to war. It's not defined by humanitarian standards. Good works are also not defined by government welfare programs. Biblical good works are not defined by social mores. Biblical good works are not defined by the vote of the people. We all voted for this, so it's okay now. Hey, the court said that, um, you know, homosexual marriage is okay, so it's okay now. Biblical good works are not defined by political agenda. Biblical good works are not defined by extra biblical revelation or religious texts. Biblical good works are not defined by emotionalism and empathetic appeals for money and goods. Biblical good works are not defined by law. No. Now here's something I want you to write down, so I hope you have some more space in your paper. If not, feel free to come up and get another piece of paper. The Bible gives a fourfold standard for good works that please God. Please write it down. There are four of them. What are the four standards that the Bible gives for what God calls good works? All truly good works must be done with four elements. Number one, in the power of the Holy Spirit, not the power of the flesh. If you're doing something in the power of the flesh, it is not a good work from God's viewpoint because the scripture clearly says, in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. So no good works fit that category. No good thing. If you're doing it in the flesh, it's not a good work. You're doing it for some ulterior motive. You know, you're doing it to impress people or you're doing it to try to win somebody's heart or you're doing it because you think that other people might come to your business and buy from you if they see you in church. It's not a good work. That's test number one. Is what you are doing being done in the power of the Holy Spirit and not in the power of the flesh? Test number two. Good works are always done to the glory of God. And whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God, Paul writes in the New Testament. Ask yourself the question, when I'm doing this, am I glorifying God? You can test everything that you do every day, every thought that you think, 
every drive and every motivation that you have, every attitude that you have by that test. Am I doing this to the glory of God? That's the second test of what God calls good works. Number three. Test number three for good works. Is, is this work being done in obedience to the word of God? If it violates a biblical principle, it is not a good work. If it violates a command of Scripture, if it violates a prohibition of Scripture, if it violates the tenor of Scripture, it is not a good work. Test number three. Is it in obedience to the Word of God? Am I doing this because I'm obeying the Word of God? Test number four, which ties us into what we are talking about tonight. Am I doing this by faith? Faith is when it's scary. Faith is when you can't see the end result. Faith is when you say, Lord, I know you told me to do this. I can't see where it's going. It seems to be going to me that it's not going to give me what I want. I don't want to go that way. I want to go around this way. I want to cut across the field in my race. I don't want to walk on the straight path because the one that goes off to the side seems to get to the destination quicker. Is it done by faith? Not by the compulsion of the law or some other standard. Are you doing it by faith? That's what produces good works. That's what pleases God. Without faith, it is really hard, but not impossible. Really hard to please him, right? Or what does it say? It says, without faith, it is. Now, what's the next word? Impossible to please him. Do you understand why Agrippa's intellectual knowledge ended him in hell? It's impossible to please him because genuine faith always produces what? Good works, works of righteousness. He didn't have it. He had it in his head, but he didn't have it 18 inches down in his heart. He missed heaven by 18 inches. He missed heaven by 18 inches. Pretty bad when you think about eternity. 18 inches. You see, genuine faith will change your life. Genuine faith will change the way you live. You wrote that down. I told you that was my main theme tonight because we're studying Agrippa and the almost believe symptom. And there are so many people sitting in churches today that almost believe, but it does not change their life. And they keep walking in the flesh thinking they're Christians. But your works don't save you. You've heard me say it before, putting a wheelbarrow into a garage doesn't turn it into a car. Being in a pure church pew doesn't mean you're saved. The four things, good works from God's definition, and I just gave you the verses, I quoted them as we went through them. Good works, according to God, must be done in the power of the Holy Spirit, not in the power of the flesh. Good works must be always done to the glory of God, not for your own aggrandizement or somebody else's aggrandizement, but to the glory of God. Good works must always be done in obedience to the Word of God. If you're disobeying the Word of God, it's not a good work. And number four, good works are always works that are done by faith, not by the law, and certainly not by the flesh. I can't believe our time is up. I'm only halfway through this message. <laughs> I mean, I can preach on for another hour. Somebody this morning actually asked me to do that. But I know you all can't take that. I hope you've picked up some things tonight. I hope you wrote them down. I've given you some very key, simple outlines to understand what is going on with King Agrippa. 
because it also goes on in the modern American evangelical church. A head knowledge without genuine faith. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word and for its power. Father, even as I preach, I'm under conviction of sin for things which I know that I should have walked by faith and I didn't. And I confess those to you. And as I confess them and as I repent, I know that you're faithful and just to forgive me for my sins because walking by faith or walk not walking by faith is sin. And so I confess as sin the times that I've not walked by faith. I confess as sin the times that I've not done my works in the power of the Holy Spirit, but I've done them in the power of the flesh. I confess as sin the times that I've done things that were not to the glory of God. I confess as sin the times when I've not been obedient to the Word of God. I confess as sin the times that my works were not done by faith. I thank you, Father, that your word declares if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Father, I pray that you cause every one of us here and any who are listening over the internet to examine ourselves to see whether or not we are in the faith or whether or not we are reprobate. An honest evaluation because without an honest evaluation we'll be like King Agrippa. Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian because being a Christian means having genuine faith that results in works that you have predestined before the world began that we should walk, walk progressive sanctification, practical sanctification that we should walk in them. Thank you again, Father, for this time tonight. Bless your word to our hearts, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.